Welcome to our February 2023 event. Uh, this is the Los Angeles ACM SIGGRAPH presenting computer graphics for wildfire mapping. I'm Joan Collins, chair of the Los Angeles SIGGRAPH. We're, welcome, we're welcoming you all here tonight and we are the professional chapter of the Los Angeles Association for Computing Machinery Special Interest Group on Computer Graphics and interactive techniques. We're the nonprofit group that disseminates educational information, and we are all volunteers. Our parent organization is ACM, and they are celebrating 75 years of advanced computing this year. This will also be the 50th anniversary of the SIGGRAPH conference this summer at the SIGGRAPH conference in uh, the uh, Los Angeles Convention, Convention Center. Um, so it's back in Los Angeles this year. It's uh, Sunday, August 6th through August 10th. Uh, and if you want more information on it, you can go to https colon backslash backslash s2023.sigraph.org. Um, and we'll be putting a lot of this up in our chat to help you all out. Our upcoming presenter tonight is Gregory Elwood. He's a GIS specialist with the Los or with the Ventura, excuse me, the Ventura County Fire Department. Um, and he'll go through um, the software uh, that they use today to battle wildfires all over California and as well as Washington. But he'll go through that. Um, but before we jump to his presentation, just let me um, give you a few announcements and we'll just jump right into it. Uh, we have many more special events coming up this season. Uh, tonight is, of course, computer, computer graphics for wildfire mapping uh, with Gregory. And um, April 11th with Ed Lance is the future of AI in arts and entertainment. Um, May 9th uh, will be the JPL panel presentation at JPL. I think we're going to need, uh, and that's a that's an in-person event, um, but I think we will be needing your driver's licenses for that one if you want to join us in person. We have another um, in-person one coming up uh, right after that. There's two meetings actually in June. Um, one is the State of the Metaverse 2023 with Larry Rosenthal. And uh, we also have um, an, another in-person, which is um, the uh, MSG Sphere Studio Tour out in Burbank. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, if you um, become a member of our chapter, uh, you gain access um, for free to all of these events this year. So it's a good idea to become a member of our chapter. For $40 a year, you get all 10 meetings, and in this case, more than 10 meetings. Uh, and the in-person ones, we do feed you all of that. $40 a year for all of that. And we feed you. Um, and if you would like to know uh, what's available, um, with our chapter, if you'd like to get involved, um, you can uh, contact me, chair at lacigraph.org. If you uh, have any questions for the secretary or treasurer or vice chair, you same thing, secretary at lacigraph.org, treasurer at, the same thing all the way through. Uh, and or if you have questions for our um, membership chair, how to become a member, et cetera, membership at lacigraph.org. Our presentations are supported, fortunately, uh, by the skin of my nose tonight, um, by our electronic services committee, including, thank you, Leonard Daly. Thank you, Franz Zandonella, Benjamin, and also Rick Hernandez. Um, and then also, uh, we do have elections coming up. All of the positions, of course, are available for you to run um, and or just to volunteer, whatever you guys would like to do out there. Uh, we 
are supposed to only be in Los Angeles, but now that we've all gone virtual, uh, we are seen all over the world, especially tonight, um, many, many from all over. Um, so um, I would like to flip it to uh, Gregory Elwood. One more little tiny thing, which is our, um, our volunteers that are with us tonight are many, um, including I, who am your chair, Joan Collins, our vice chair is um, Larry Rosenthal. Our secretary is Rick Hernandez. Our treasurer is Dave Kurlinder. And our membership is handled by both um, Sharon Eisenberg and Fran Zandunella Benjamin. So uh, without further ado, and uh, Gregory, uh, at any moment, you can turn your camera on. Um, and come on in. Uh, Gregory here is um, uh, the GIS specialist with the Ventura County Fire Department. Uh, and again, he will go through the software and everything that they do to battle wildfires in California using computer graphics. Um, the software application ArcGIS Pro, published by the Environmental Systems Research Institute, ESRI in Redlands, California, is the designated software used by geographic information system specialists, GISS, to provide maps and mapping support to the incident commanders and wildland wild land firefighters. Yes, there will be a test after all of this. So anyway, Gregory, Thank you for being so patient with us all tonight. Uh, I'll try to get out of the way with you here just momentarily, but um, welcome to this whole thing. Are you ready to go? You ready to take this? Can I hear a hello? Hey. Hello. Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just going to jump out of the way. I swear okay. I will not try to interrupt <clears throat> you Excuse me. often, but if you do hear my <laughs> lovely voice, in the background, I swear I'll be really polite in the background, uh, but uh, it'll just be because I had a burning question to do with that thing you very, very just said. Otherwise I will fade into the distance with all my other people who are here tonight joining us. Uh, and I'm sure your presentation is gonna be fantastic. So anyway, have at it, Gregory, have a great presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see. I'm going to share my screen. You may. And the first thing we're going to do is jump into a PowerPoint presentation. Always fun. And so before we get to the computer graphics part, we're going to look at a question about how do you know where a large wildfire is? But before we start, I have one housekeeping uh, announcement to make, which is that my speaking tonight as not as a representative of the Ventura County Fire Department, I am speaking as a representative of myself. If you want to know more about the Ventura County Fire Department, go to vcfd.org. Uh, they have lots of information and you can contact our public information officers to ask questions. Fair enough. Uh, we're, we're going to... Let's see, yes, vcfd.org in chat, thank you. So how do you know where a large wildfire is? Uh, let's see. Well, somebody sees it, usually a large plume of smoke. Uh, wildfires, the smoke is usually very noticeable. Uh, it's often being driven by winds. Uh, definitely here in Southern California, we have large pyrocumulus clouds. Uh, so you always almost know where a large wildfire is because you see smoke. The Forest Service continues to maintain a network of lookout towers in the Western United States. Uh, they have information on their website about their lookout towers. They have a program where you can volunteer to man a lookout tower. Inside the lookout tower, you have the observer's camping equipment and a large disc, which is known as an Osborne Firefinder. 
The Osborne Firefinder was originally developed in the early 20th century. It was phased out by the Forest Service in the 1970s and 80s. They never really found a better replacement for it, so they have brought it back. So the Osborne Firefighter Firefinder, excuse me, is finding its way back into the lookout towers that the Forest Service has in the Western United States. Aviation platforms like helicopters are extremely useful for locating wildfires. The flight crews are changed, trained especially to look for smoke and for other indications of activity that may pose a hazard. Helicopters are often used to assess the extent and damage of wildfires as well. This is from a, a fire in 2011 in Ventura County called the Skyline Fire. This fire burned very close to some agricultural property, specifically some orchards. Remote sensing. There's two basic types of remote sensing, aviation platforms and satellite platforms. The federal government operates a program called the National Infrared Operations, or NIROPS. NIROPS is an aviation-based uh, system. This is not a NIROPS plane, but it is an example of the type of aircraft that NIROPS flies. This is a Piper Citation. It is a twin engine aircraft that is capable of staying aloft for long periods of time and covering large areas. The IR scanner is located under the nose. It scans the surface of uh, the planet underneath the airplane. Uh, it can be uh, obscured by clouds. So IR data is not uh, absolute in some cases. Inside the plane behind the pilots is an infrared operator, a technician. He works with a laptop. The laptop shows the position and heading of the aircraft and gives the infrared technician the ability to monitor the collection of the infrared data. This is an example of infrared data that is put into a fire map. Uh, this was from uh, 2020 up in the Modoc National Forest. Uh, we're going to zoom in for a little bit. There's four types of graphic displays for the infrared data. There's the isolated heat, which occurs as a spot, the heat perimeter, which shows the extent of the fire. There is an intense heat shaded by uh, slashed lines, and not in this view, but there's a scattered heat that's a polygon shaded by polka dots. Satellites come as MODIS, the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer, and VERS, Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer. This image is an example of MODIS and VERS data displayed in Google Earth. Uh, this was from two years ago. We had a rather severe fire season in the late summer and early fall of 2021. You can see that there are multiple fires in California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. A little zoom in to two fires that were in Southern California that year. In the, Los An in the Angeles and San Bernardino National Forests. A further zoom in to the fire in the Angeles National Forest. The infrared points are generally symbolized by time, yellow being older and the red being more recent. There is a website uh, that I believe will be posted in the chat called the NASA Lance Firms website. It's a uh, public domain available to anyone to log into. This is also uh, MODIS and VERS data from two years ago, uh, summer and fall of 2021. Again, you can see the distribution of fires in California, Oregon and Washington and Idaho. Zooming in to look at two fires in Northern California and the fire in Oregon at that time was the bootleg fire. The NASA Lance Firms website gives you the ability to load visible Earth imagery underneath the heat signatures. So you can see how the prevailing winds and the smoke plumes 
are playing out and what the distribution of the heat signature is for those particular fires. A little zoom out to show Oregon and Washington, not a good uh, fire year, very bad. You can also see that up north at the US Canadian border, some of the fires actually slopped over into Canada. In the northeast corner of Washington, there's more fires as is at the very top of Idaho, just below the Canadian border. Wait, so you're saying all of the white is smoke that is uh, on an offshore breeze, is that what you're saying? On this particular day, at this time when this image was taken, there was a high pressure system over the northern four corners and it was pushing winds uh, correct offshore uh, in both Washington and Oregon. And then you can see up in Canada, it's actually going pretty much almost to the north. Zooming in to the bootleg fire in Oregon, uh, it's basically, this is a basic uh, visualization of the MODIS and VERS data. The website allows you to parse out the colors into time. Pale yellow is over 24 hours. The middle oranges are three to six hours. And the most uh, intense red, the darkest red is less than an hour old. This not only allows you to see the distribution of heat in the fire, which helps to determine the fire perimeter, but it also gives you an indication of where the fire is actively burning on the edges of the perimeter, as well as within the perimeter. This is information that the firefighters and the incident commanders need to know. Incident mapping. Specialized vehicles are often used for incident mapping. This is a battalion vehicle, battalion chief vehicle for Ventura County Fire. This is at a night operations. This was south of Simi Valley. This particular vehicle, the rear end of the vehicle opens up. It has a computer monitor, a drawer that opens up. Documents and maps can be placed on the drawer. They can be hand marked by the incident commanders to track the spread of the fire. There's radio communications, as well as the ability to access the internet. But so, so your internet access is uh, what gets you all the data of the, the mountain ranges, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems like really you're not operating on a VFX server backbone here. It's basically well, you and your little laptops out there in the middle of the wild. In the initial hours of a fire, what's known as IA, initial attack, uh, organization of the responding units is not fully congealed. So sometimes you have several of these vehicles in one location. Sometimes you have uh, multiple locations for these vehicles and they coordinate via radio. They don't really use the internet in the initial hours of a large wildfire. They primarily use the radio to speak to each other to get an idea of where the fire is and how it's spreading given the wind, uh, humidity and fuel conditions. Ventura County Fire maintains a specialized vehicle known as a mapping van. Uh, it's our GIS mapping van. Uh, her call sign is MAP11. MAP11 is capable of being deployed to and operating from remote locations. Wait, 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 Go. you have to go back. And you're not allowed to sleep in there. Your little tent has to be outside and then you just do the work inside. Sometimes you do sleep in the van. Sometimes oh, yeah. there's people working in the van 24 hours. Mm -mm -mm. And the only way for you to effectively get a rest period is to have uh, a, your own shelter, like a tent. Uh, sometimes they book a, a hotel room or a motel room for you if one's available, not always. Uh, we do deploy to remote locations with camping equipment in order to be able to have an effective rest period if people are working inside the van. The van itself is often used for briefings. There's a large flat screen monitor that travels inside the van. We put it on the side. Information that is displayed on the incident laptop can be shown on the external monitor. It's often used for giving briefings. Wildfires are managed on a 24-hour schedule divided into two 12-hour periods. 
The day shift starts at 6 a.m. and the night shift starts at 6 p.m. Mapping products and fire information is almost always uh, updated and revised prior to each one of those two briefings. So it ends up being very close to a 24 hour a day operation. Uh, here's map 11. So map 11 in this photo was sent to the uh, start of the Thomas fire in December, 2017, which uh, at one time was the largest fire in California. It has since been uh, surpassed by other fires up north. Uh, and in this case, how do you know where a large wildfire is? Well, <laughs> it's across the street behind you. The Thomas fire started in Santa Paula. Map 11 was sent to the fire station in Santa Paula. Uh, we were there for about an hour or two. Uh, and then the fire grew so large that we had to re relocate all of the command uh, and control resources to the Ventura County Fairgrounds. Here's the Ventura County Fairgrounds the next morning, the sun coming up, the sky very red from the smoke from the Thomas fire. Map 11 at the Ventura County Fairgrounds. Specialized third-party vendor trailers that are known as GIS trailers are often contracted for large incidents like wildfires. This company called Display Geographics is from up near uh, the Salinas area. They come down, everybody gets a trailer. Display Geographics has a couple of generators. The Ventura County Sheriffs are in the background there. Ventura County Ops 11 is a specialized trailer. Uh, that's a large generator uh, trailer, that yellow and blue one uh, in the middle there. The Thomas fire grew so large, so fast, that two GIS trailers were ordered for it, which is actually kind of rare since the, the cost of the GIS trailers is a little bit on the expensive side. But the Thomas fire was so big uh, that they ended up uh, booking two trailers for it. This is what the inside of one of the displayed geographics GIS trailers looks like. On the left is a long table of work areas. The vendor often supplies external monitors or extra monitors. You can see the laptops on the table. Those are usually brought by the incident GISS from their home unit. There's a large plotter in the back that lets us print large maps, an office printer on the shelf in front of it, a large display monitor over on the right, paper maps taped to the wall on the left, it's very much uh, a combination of electronic and hand-drawn information. Information on a large wildfire, specifically the Thomas fire, uh, uh, changes very rapidly. So you need to use a lot of techniques to be able to keep uh, on top of it. And one question again, um, for us in computer graphics, we generally do not let smoke into the room where the computer equipment is. And in, the, in your case, your dinky air conditioner unit up front is not obviously getting rid of all the dust. So you must have some hardware that is, you know, built to withstand dust and smoke continuously. Well, uh, it is a problem. Uh, you, these trailers are not um, what you could call uh, <laughs> clean room sealed. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the air conditioner for the trailer does what it can. Uh, we basically deal with it by keeping the door closed. Uh, sometimes they bring in a fan to blow out the dust and the smoke. In this particular case, dust was not an excessive problem because we were at the Ventura County Fairgrounds. Sometimes federal firefighters and federal GIS on in national forests at remote locations do have to deal with smoke and dust. Uh, so it can become a problem. You make a lot of maps on the initial attack of a fire. This is just a small sample of maps that we made the morning after the Thomas fire started. Uh, we made literally hundreds and thousands of these maps over the next month, over the period of time that the Thomas fire was active. A lot of times the maps are displayed on boards that are placed in an area where a large group can congregate and this accommodates the briefings, the day shift briefing and the night shift briefing. 
Other third-party vendors often accompany the uh, government trailers. This is Digby's copy bus. This bus was retrofitted to be full of copy machines. He has reams of paper delivered, and he makes copies of tons of documents, not necessarily maps. There's all kinds of information that is driven by a fire. Uh, forms, uh, briefing reports, you name it. So uh, a, a vendor such as Digby's, or other times it's a large trailer that's pulled by a semi-rig, will come to a fire and they will be an on-site uh, document copying resource for that incident. These days, post-COVID, when you check in at a large fire, you do so with a phone or mobile device using a QR code. You scan the check-in QR code. It brings up a form that you fill in your name, your resource order number, what unit you're from, the date and time you arrived. You can go to the briefings QR code and you get a time schedule of when the briefings are going to occur. If you go to the maps QR code, it will actually allow you to download some of the maps that have been created to that date. And then over in the far end, there's a QR code for what's known as an IAP. IAP stands for Incident Action Plan. I'll show you an example of that later in the uh, presentation. Uh, it's basically a document that's kind of a booklet. It shows maps of the fire, but it also shows the orders, who's supposed to be on what part of the fire, where the uh, safety zones are, where the uh, medical facilities are, who the commanders are, telephone numbers, radio frequencies, all the information that the firefighters need to be able to function on an active incident. After the Thomas fire uh, basically was contained and controlled in late December, a very strong rainstorm occurred in January of 2018. Now, this is outside my house, and the reason I'm showing this is because I'd lived in my home for well over 10 years when this rainstorm came in January of 2018. And I had never seen the rainwater create a sediment flow that went that far out into the street before. So this is an indication of how severe that rain event was. It was one of the heaviest rainstorms Southern California has ever experienced. Five hours later, one of my colleagues from VCFD and myself were in Map 11, traveling north on Pacific Coast Highway. You can see the darkened hills on the right. The Thomas Fire burned all the way to the ocean in multiple locations. We only got about as far as the county line. We encountered severe flooding and some highway damage. We literally had to turn around and go south on the northbound side of the freeway back to the previous uh, on-ramp exchange, interchange. You can see vehicles on the right going north on the southbound lane. Those are people who were called up to respond to the Montecito debris flow. It got a little crazy. The closer we got to Montecito. <laughs> Excuse me, it, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. It got a little crazy. We, the closer we got to Montecito, the, the more active flooding we encountered. They had the road next to the freeway cleared at the base of the canyon. We decided to go up the canyon in map 11. We went east or west from the top of the canyon and came down an additional canyon where we encountered more active flooding and active uh, construction attempts to remove uh, the debris. There was a tremendous amount of damage. Some of these homes were just literally almost wiped out. When we got to where the power lines were down, that's when I started to get uh, a little bit on the very concerned size. It turned out these particular power lines had already been de-energized, but since they were laying in the water and we were driving through large uh, flood areas of water with power lines in them, uh, initially it was um, quite the concern. We got back down next to the freeway and continued north to Montecito. It took about four hours to do the one hour drive from Ventura County to Santa Barbara. We got there about one o'clock in the afternoon. Map 11 definitely showed 
uh, that she uh, was uh, a survivor of uh, some flood uh, waters getting up there. When we got to the Earl Warren showgrounds, where the Montecito Debris Flow Incident Command Post was located, Santa Barbara County Fire and Santa Barbara County Sheriffs already had an ac active incident command post uh, in place. This map, the red shaded portion on the right, is the perimeter of the Thomas Fire. You can see there's a large arm that stretches out from east to west that went completely over the mountains north of the community of Montecito. On the other side of this wall, a series of tile maps were put together to show the community of Montecito in its entirety. The blue polygons are the USGS floodplains. This map was used to help determine what the operational areas of the response to the Montecito debris flow was going to be. So if you were trying to pick what area to not live in in Montecito, if you had to choose, it would be most of Mont Montecito. Uh, the USGS has these available for people to look at and download if you want to know where floodplains are anywhere in the United States and Alaska and Hawaii. You can go to the US. I don't have that uh, link uh, that I can post in chat, but you, but you had search. to deal with that because you were mapping not just a fire, but this was now uh, a mud flow. Uh, they, well, they, they put this together to give people coming in uh, an idea of what the area looked like and how much of that area, the city of Montecito was affected by the debris flow. This gives you an initial assessment of how much damage area you're going to be working with, whether you are one of the search and rescue responders or whether you're one of the mapping uh, personnel. Map 11 lived at Earl Warren Showgrounds for about a day and a half. Uh, then they sent uh, map 11 back to Ventura County. Uh, they, they feed you while you're there. Again, displayed geographics, uh, cleaned up one of their trailers and sent one trailer down to the Earl Warren showgrounds to be to respond and provide mapping support for the um, 2018 Montecito debris flow. Again, the inside of that particular displayed geographics trailer one of the Santa Barbara County Fire GIS specialists working on a map of the community of Montecito. The Earl Warren Show Showgrounds, uh, it's a pretty interesting place. It was the first time I'd ever been there. Uh, many of the fire crews and the search and rescue personnel uh, had to bunk at the showgrounds. Uh, they bring uh, their own tents for that purpose. They also evacuated uh, quite a lot of livestock to the showgrounds from the uh, area affected by both the fire and the debris flow. I was told by one uh, very colorful person at the showgrounds that that uh, particular bull was worth more than map 11. I don't know if that's true. That could be true. After about a week, CAL FIRE came to the, uh, CAL FIRE was in unified command with Santa Barbara County uh, Fire and Sheriff as well as uh, some command elements from the Forest Service. After about a week, CAL FIRE offered the GIS personnel to go for a drive through the uh, damage uh, area. On the left is a CAL FIRE captain driving us in his vehicle. On the right is a captain from Kern County uh, Fire Department, myself taking this picture, and to the right of me was the Santa Barbara County Fire GIS person. Uh, we left the incident command post and started driving through the community of Montecito. Quite a lot of damage. So this was a house in one of the canyons. And if you've ever watched- say, It looks like two outhouses, but no. No, this is the gate. This was the front gate and the uh, homeowner's wall and driveway apparently were completely swept away. Now, if you've ever paid attention to disaster response, you may have noticed that this was particularly uh, um, prevalent in, like in Hurricane Katrina and some other floods and fires in the United States. There is a graphic pattern that search and rescue personnel use when they search uh, a location. 
That pattern is in this format. They make that first slash from the upper left to the lower right. They put in the date and time they arrived. On the left, they put in which unit came to search the location. If any immediate hazards were uh, in place, they put those on the right and whether or not any victims were found. And then when they depart, they make the second slash from the upper right down to the lower left. So if we go back to this, you can see, you can't really read the date and time. And there is a unit there on the left side. The big zero with the cross through it meant they found no people at this location, which is good. Nobody stuck, nobody deceased, kind of, even though yeah. the structure never, itself is I never damaged. knew that whole coding. I yeah. think it's a whole new thing. Yes, you can, you can look that up. Uh, here's a view of the house. Um, you can see the trees kind of knocked over. You can also sort of see, the, not very well, but you can see the foundation of the house is damaged. If you turn around and look at the creek bed in front of the house, that whole creek bed got washed out by the debris flow. Here are Southern California Edison crews replacing poles and trying to reconnect the power lines so that power can come back to the community. Here's another view of a creek that got scoured out. Uh, that house had its uh, foundation pretty severely damaged. You can see on that uh, house how high up that water was. Yeah, the, the debris flow gouged out these creeks. Many of these homes had very idyllic views of small creeks mm. on their property, and the small creeks became raging torrents filled yeah. with logs and boulders. So this is what happens. Mm. Uh, driving up further into the canyon, this was a recreational uh, location. That building completely destroyed. The night of the debris flow, a gas main was ruptured and a gas explosion and fire occurred as well as the debris flow. You can kind of see that there is a bit of a crater there from where this gas line exploded. They replaced this gas line right away. This is next to the gas line. When I took this picture, the mud there was still wet and it was about four to five feet deep. You couldn't walk on it. You would sink down into it. That debris flow continued downstream from the gas line location for hundreds of yards. Back in the car, uh, you can see the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's are interviewing a person who was trying to get to their home. If the uh, sheriffs set up a area that say, don't come in, don't come in, because they will find you and they will pull you over. This is an Army Corps of Engineers crew drilling holes into an excessively large boulder that they later inserted dynamite in to blow the boulder into smaller pieces so that the heavy construction equipment could lift the smaller pieces and remove them from the area. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we went from Montecito up to an area known as the Buena Vista Trailhead. This is a Google Earth image of what the Buena Vista Trailhead looks like before the debris flow. Uh, this is looking down, uh, and that location where the camera is is where I was taking my photographs. Also a Google Street View of what that location on Park Lane looked like. You can see the fence on the right-hand side. It's like a metal or vinyl fence with a chain link behind it. Those metal fence posts were sheared off by the debris flow as if they were cut with a knife. There's the metal poles for the chain yeah. link fence, completely washed, you know, bent over by the debris flow. This is a Google Earth image of the canyon above where the Buena Vista the trailhead is. Mm. That's before and that's after. Dang. Once again, that's before and that's after. I took a picture from the road looking up the canyon. That flat area in front of me was supposed to be a debris basin. It had filled up with mud and boulders and therefore no longer served any function whatsoever. It just allowed the debris flow to flow completely over it. If you look below the road, you can see a kind of a metal object here. That's a huge culvert. And that's what the culvert looked like after the debris flow. The Kern County fire captain went down into the culvert and this is the photograph he took. So not only did the debris basin fill up, 
but then the culvert was blocked with boulders and uh, mud, excuse me, and uh, other debris, uh, rendering it effectively useless for draining anything from that debris basin. Coming back down, there were numerous power company crews trying to re uh, reinstall power poles and reconnect the power grid for the community. We saw a few more houses severely impacted. Yes, that's a car sticking out the side of that house. That's a huge metal beam for a bridge that was bent and washed away. Beam. Holy moly, that's a lot of power right there. Uh, you can see where the, this house was severely damaged. Uh, apparently this house was built on a foundation of boulders. Um, I was told this was a location where the debris flow swept away a person from this door. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I was told. Well, uh, we lost a lot of people in this incident. Uh, it was pretty severe. Uh, so that horizontal bar on the upper left is the road. So that was an actual road uh, adjacent to a creek and the debris flow scoured the creek about 15 feet below the road surface and then washed out the road surface and then deposited just hundreds of boulders in the area. Uh, another house severely damaged, more houses damaged. I mean, this is just what you have to do going to work every day. Uh, well, I'm not a search and rescue person. Well, so I know, I know, not... but you aren't the, but you have to try to get your equipment there. And you're showing us some of the situations where getting the equipment and getting yourself set up is no That's small not... feat. Definitely it's not like some... we, you've got an IT group that goes up and, you know, sets you up and then boom, there you are. And all you do is sit there and do roto. <laughs> well, most definitely some situations are more challenging than others. So back at Earl Warren Showgrounds, uh, back with the mapping. So here's one of the operations maps for the debris flow. And you can see that they divided the community into red areas that were operational areas labeled divisions. Uh, they've got this Cold Springs, Hot Springs, North, Piquet, Romero. Down here was the Olive Division and then the South Division. They all had the whole thing uh, done in an East Branch. Um, this is uh, San Isidro Creek. And then these blue polygons were updated from the USGS floodplains. So these show the actual footprint Can you zoom of the in? debris I'm not, flow. I'm not seeing what you're seeing, triangles. We're not all seeing the same resolution. Just zoom in a little bit. Uh, I don't know if I one? can zoom. I don't okay. think I can zoom in on this. Okay. Not right now. Not that one. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a zoomed in for the olive division. Santa Barbara County has a GIS layer of building footprints. So this, you get an idea of how many structures were in the footprint of the debris flow. And the footprint of the debris flow, the blue, is also augmented with a polygon shaded by crosshatching, which shows uh, which structures were in the highest area of damage. This is one of the maps that I made early for myself. So I ended up being assigned to vehicles. So a large number of vehicles were found in the debris flow area uh, that had been swept away from their original locations. Um, we ended up trying to make lists or charts of as many of the vehicles as possible some of the vehicles, you could tell what make and model and color they were, and some even had a license plate. Some, there was no information whatsoever. This is what a vehicle looks like when you really can't get any information. That sometimes was a Ferrari, they, yeah. Yeah, sometimes they can find the engine and they can get a VIN, and they can look it up through the California DMV to find out who the registered owner is and what the registered address of this vehicle is. Many of these vehicles were found hundreds of yards downstream from where they were parked at people's residences. So here's an example of an IAP. I had mentioned an incident action plan earlier in the presentation. So an incident action plan is basically a booklet. It's a smaller booklet. It's usually printed on 11 by 17, sometimes uh, eight and a half by 11. And it's a series of pages and the maps that are produced for the IAP come in a series. So you can see in the upper right, there's a red poly, red square that um, indicates how many pages of maps there are for this IAP. There's page one, which shows you the buildings that were the most severely damaged in red. 
uh, the blue polygons. It gives you the uh, um, tells you what uh, shows you in the uh, legend what page that is. You go to the next page, page two. It's the one directly underneath it. Again, the buildings are symbolized with green not damaged, red damaged, orange pa partially damaged. Uh, this was a photograph taken by uh, one of the other GIS personnel from a helicopter near the end of the two week period that we were there for the Montecito debris flow. And you can see how scoured the hills were by the fire and how the debris basically had a freeway to come down into the community. Uh, here's looking down from that same helicopter and you can easily see how the debris flows directly into the community once uh, and the barriers and the flood uh, debris basins are filled. This gives you an indication of how severely the vegetation was removed by the Thomas fire. It burned so hot and so intensely uh, that it removed all of the vegetation on the mountains above the community. And then the storm came in, possibly one of the heaviest rainstorms ever in California history. So not, not to be flippant about it, but definitely what you can call as a recipe for disaster. Well, and the news just didn't really give us that kind of um, information. A lot of this well, didn't come out to the news. I mean, I was there for two weeks. Oh, right, and At right. the end of the first week, we finally had the, the areas mm -hmm. mapped and we started getting the information about the vehicles and the structures. Right. Uh, you know, it takes time. So getting to the computer graphics part, uh, we're now going to talk a little bit about the geometric primitives that you use when you're doing fire mapping, which are the points, lines, and polygons. The National Wildfire Coordinating Group is a federal committee that oversees the work that myself and other GISs do on large incidents. So we're gonna come out of PowerPoint here very briefly, and we're gonna go to the internet, and I'm gonna go to the NWCG page, and I'm gonna come down here in symbology, and let's go to event points first. So this is the point symbology that we are currently using for large incidents, wildfires, debris flows, floods, earthquakes, whatever, to populate the maps that we use for the incident personnel. They revised all of these uh, points and graphics within the last two years, primarily to accommodate the increased use of uh, mobile devices, phones and iPads, tablets. So the colors were made more distinct the graphics in some cases were uh, simplified. This is all so they would read better on mobile devices that have smaller screens. So we're no longer primarily making maps on large pieces of paper. We're making electronic maps that are distributed, usually via a cell network or an internet connection directly to people's handheld devices. We're gonna come out from points. We're gonna go to event line. And it's essentially the same thing. The line symbology represents uh, activity and conditions uh, in the affected area. Uh, you're gonna see dozer line in some of the other maps we show. Yeah, this is the stuff I was looking at on your maps, not understanding what all the little uh, different types of lines meant. But there's, can, how many do you think of types of lines you have? Uh, I don't have a count, however many is here. I could, I'll have to count them for you. It's, I guess it's, uh, that's not one. A lot. One That's not yeah. good. That's I don't know how many. I, I just don't have that number. Yeah. They, they change them too. So they do. Uh, 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 that makes sense. Uh, completed dozer line, completed hand line are very important for fires. Mm. Um, road as uh, our road as line, planned road as line, uh, complete mixed construction line, and then fire edge. Well, you're going to show us some of these maps. And... Yes. Okay, good. So there's only three polygons. There's a kind of a great utility polygon, other. There's a prescribed fire. Prescribed fires are fires that are intentionally set to as vegetation management projects to reduce fuel loads in fire prone areas. And then wildfire daily perimeter. Uh, this ends up being updated at least twice a day to if, if necessary to accommodate the day shift briefing and the night shift briefing that we spoke about earlier. 
So we're going to come out of that and we're going to come back to PowerPoint. And we're, so here's one of the Thomas Fire operation maps. This one is dated December 7th. So this is pretty early. The Thomas Fire started over here outside of Santa Paula. Uh, this IR data for this map shows a very large perimeter for the fire. It's also a dispersed perimeter. It shows large areas of intense heat, an awful lot of uh, heat um, in you know spot heat locations. Here you can see some of the point symbology in action. So there's division breaks and branch breaks. So you can see that a branch break is here. On to the left of this branch break is branch four. To the right of this branch break is branch three in between these two branch breaks. In between the branch breaks are division breaks. Each division gets a name, usually uh, a name or sometimes like a name and a number. Uh, this is how large incidents are managed. Incident commanders will decide upon what the appropriate distribution of resources needs to be. And then they will often instruct the mapping personnel to symbolize the maps with branch and division breaks so that the responding personnel have very specific locations to go to. There are drop points that the equipment goes where they can drop off equipment. Here's the incident command post, which was at the Ventura County Fairgrounds. Here you can see that the fire has now already crossed into Santa Barbara County, but it hasn't burned to the mountains north of the city of Montecito yet. Here's a little uh, zoom in so you can see a little better. Once again, we have the infrared with the intense heat, uh, dis intense heat, uh, dispersed heat, heat perimeter, scattered heat, excuse me, and the heat points. Drop points, uh, staging points, water sources, um, and of course, the way the division and the branches are uh, designated with text. And these maps are so detailed that you have infinite zoom in down to the well, little houses and the little garbage cans, essentially. Well, when you when you print these on paper, people can have the paper map, but they can look at it as closely as they need. When we distribute these to mobile devices, the map um, usually has the ability to be zoomed into on the mobile device. Here, you can also see that there's two kinds of fire line. There's an uncontrolled fire edge, which is where the fire is still actively burning. And then there's a completed line. Completed line is where the line firefighters have literally dug into the dirt and stopped the fire from spreading at that location. You can kind of barely see it up here, but there's some completed dozer line. Uh, there's a little bit of completed dozer line uh, mixed in with uh, some of the completed line down here. So what you're doing, though, is really interactively all day long, updating, updating, updating. Once, once the area of operation and the initial perimeter of the fire has been decided upon by the incident commanders, then yes, you're getting information from the field. It's being vetted by incident command, and it's the mapping uh, specialist's job to, yes, constantly update the maps using standard symbology. Here's a map of the perimeter without any of the heat data in it. Again, this is from December 7th. This is a map from December 29th of December 2017. So now the fire has gotten all the way over. There's that large arm that burned into uh, Santa Barbara County above the community of Montecito. The fire was to transcend the county boundary. So county boundary was very prominently uh, displayed. You can see on this map that you still have uncontrolled fire edge here near the origin as well as here in this northern portion of the fire perimeter in Ventura County. And you've got uh, uncontrolled fire edge burning in, Vent uh, excuse me, Santa Barbara County. A lot now the of The line. county line is so that someone can tell who's supposed to be paying for it? Well, the county line has a, a lot to do with jurisdictional response. On a fire this size, um, really the, the jurisdictional response was so massive that it wasn't, really sort of delineated by county line. Uh, but definitely the incident commanders wanted to know how big this fire was and how much of it was in Ventura County and how much of it was in uh, Santa Barbara County. So that, that, wasn't, that wasn't necessarily directly an operational concern, but, it, but it's a 
pretty political concern, yes, for incident commanders. So this is an image I created. This was the final perimeter of the Thomas fire after it was finally put out in late December, early January uh, of 2018. And these golden polygons all around the perimeter are fire history polygons. Fire history polygons show where there previously was a fire. And if you'll notice, there's not a lot of the golden polygons inside the perimeter of the Thomas fire. What that means is that the Thomas fire had uh, um, an intense amount of fuel that hadn't been burned in an extended period of time, in some case, well over 20 years, in which to consume once it got started. You have to remember that an important component of this is the wind event. So we were having severe Santa Ana winds, and when you have a wind event in an air, a large area with a lot of unburnt fuels, this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get a fire that spreads exponentially and defies your best efforts to contain it and control Yeah, so you have to track wind too. I'm also getting um, a question. People are liking your slides here, Gregory, and are going to be begging um, in more rapid frequency uh, to get copies of some of these. So let me uh, hit you back on that when we get a little further down the presentation, sorry. Okay, um, there's a, a two-pronged answer to that. Uh, not all fire information is made available to the public. Um, ultimately, fire information, including perimeters and maps, are made available to the public. Uh, they're, they being like the uh, NWCG and another organization known as NIFSI, National Interagency Fire S uh, Center, they, uh, they're coming up with protocols to be able to disseminate information to the public. Uh, but um, it is possible to obtain some fire maps especially maps if you believe you live in an affected area. That's interesting. Okay, well, I'll, I'll follow up with you on that one. Okay, so this is a fire that occurred in January of 2021 in the city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, this was the Herbs fire. Herbs is E-R-B-E-S, which is a street. Uh, this happened uh, late in the evening after about 6 p.m. So once again, we're gonna come out of PowerPoint and I'm going to go to my herbs fire and we're going to play a little video. So you can see the wind is uh, always a component. And we're going to zoom in here on a bulldozer. There it is. You can see the lights of the bulldozer. And yeah. he's down there in sure. the fire trying to scrape up enough. Oh, that's a bulldozer. That's a bulldozer. That's a guy in a bulldozer and he's scraping a fire line right next to the fire. Those guys are crazy. And then a little later here, let's see if I can get it. Oh, maybe it was over here. Oh, here it is. That's me driving. And we're gonna have a helicopter come in here in a second. Uh, there's a vehicle going by. I mean, we have a windy night out there tonight. Wind events uh, are a problem. And, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm noting uh, from what you're doing, it's not just fire, it's not just mud, it's not just any any one thing. Oh. It's you have to really. I get what oh, the here comes our helicopter. Happening. And a helicopter. So he flies. The these guys are these guys are crazy. They fly right down into the fire. And you're gonna see over on the left side of the screen, he's gonna drop some water over yes. here. Over here. Watch over here. And there you see the water coming out of the helicopter. Oh yeah, oh no fun. Yeah. So come out of that, back to PowerPoint. Tracking wind, that must be hard. One of the polygons for the herbs fire this was an early polygon. It came to us uh, as a KML, which for those who know is uh, the native format for Google Earth. We can receive KMLs that are collected from the field personnel on their handheld devices uh, using um, uh, uh, an application known as Avenza. Uh, ESRI also has an application known as Field Maps that we're currently using. This was ultimately the final perimeter of the herbs fire. It burned on both sides. You can see here Herbs Road. Uh, 
to the west of the road, it was 6.7 acres. To the right of the road, it was 19.8 acres, almost 20 acres. It came this close to these houses. Uh, and it also, maybe there were some threats to some of the structures up here. Uh, there's three designations here I wanna point out. There's an LRA, SRA, and FRA. Those stand for local response area, state response area, and federal response area. In this case, there's two colors here. There's gray and yellow. This fire occurred in the local response area because it was within the city limits of Thousand Oaks. If the fire had crossed the city limits and gone into the state responsibility area, then different contractual obligations uh, come into place. Ventura County Fire Department is what's known as a contract county. We contract with CAL FIRE to provide response in state responsibility areas in our county. Uh, we also use some phone apps for fires. So this is my work phone. Uh, this is an, an app known as VCAB, uh, not available to the public. Uh, this is showing uh, location of two vehicles, Engine 84 and Battalion 14. Remember that battalion truck I showed you where it had the computer in the back? Right. And it gives you an indication of the status. So occasionally we'll get a fire and I'll get a ping on my work phone. It'll say it's a vegetation fire. Medic Engine 1 from the city of Ventura is responding to it. It's not there yet. So it's not red when the uh, asset is on scene, when the apparatus is on scene, the uh, flag changes to red. But when it's on en route, it's still a yellow. You can change the base map in VCAD. This particular vegetation fire is occurring in the Ventura River bed, which is an indication of a fire that um, most likely was possibly started by a homeless camp. Uh, we most unfortunately see a lot of homeless campfires in Ventura County, as do residents in um, Los Angeles County. Uh, this is a fire up in Washington State in 2021. Uh, this was the uh, Green Ridge, Lick Creek Green Ridge. These tents are known as yurts, and these were temporarily set up in an RV park known as the Last Resort uh, near where the fire was. This is the door of one of the yurts. Again, Green Lick Creek Green Ridge, you uh, access fire information with your QR code on your phone. In this case, this QR code linked everyone to check in, demo, finance maps, IEP training, and more. This, uh, I was very uh, fortunate to work with this Rocky Mountain Interagency Management Team, Incident Management Team. Those guys were on the ball. Uh, by the way, this was an all female team, except for me and a couple of other guys. Um, this is a map of the last resort ICP. So we had uh, the incident command post, the mapping trailer was down here where plans is, uh, check-in demo finance. This is what the inside of one of the yurts looks like. Uh, they did end up bringing in a portable air conditioning unit for the yurts because the valley filled up with smoke rather severely uh, in the week that I was there. And here's one of the uh, kind of the transportation maps. So the last chance resort is up here where the ICP is. And then various camps and uh, facilities were dispersed along this road, including dip sites and some staging areas. And then the actual fire was down here uh, in the um, National Forest. And you can see that they have, uh, again, H is for hill spot, DP is drop point. Uh, I think there's uh, some water sites, there's some repeaters for radio, some other things. And this was a paper map that was um, pose, uh, posted to the uh, outside of one of the yurts. So people could come into camp and they could see what was happening with the fire. And if they had an order to go to a specific location, it would help them locate that location. That is pretty much my presentation. Does well, anyone have any questions? I would very much like you to go to one of those maps, maybe from your um, your computer itself, so that you can push in on some of the detail on some of this. Uh, well, I actually um, have one other okay. thing to show. Okay, well, then you're not really done. Okay, so this is ArcGIS Pro. This is a license of ArcGIS Pro that is currently running on my uh, incident laptop. 
yes, which is yes. being used to give this presentation. Okay. This is a custom polygon of the location of wildland fuels in Ventura County. It is a work in progress. You can see that I've managed to dig into it in a number of locations. And I'm using this to propose some fuel bed boundaries. So I'm gonna turn off the fuel bed boundaries and I'm gonna zoom into this area, which is the Santa Rosa Hills. Actually, I wanna clear that. And I can change the base map here. This is all ESRI software now from uh, topographic to imagery. Oh, I see what you're doing. And then I can go down, drill down way into this. And so the purpose of being able to do this map is to show where concentrations of wildland fuel are in a given area. And, and what area land, is what area is this that we're looking at just off? It's known as the Santa Rosa Hills oh, I see. in Ventura County. It's an unincorporated area. Santa Rosa is not a not a city in Ventura County. Um, this is uh, Thousand Oaks down here. So down here where I have a lot of these polygons already cut very finely, this is the city of Thousand Oaks. But this area up here is more of a not unincorporated county area. So I'm still kind of working on this. And I'm gonna come down into where this uh, orchard is again. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into edit and I'm going to select this portion of the polygon here. And I had previously used the split tool to cut this polygon out of the rest of the polygon. And then I can remove it. And that's how this map is being developed. It is known as what's, it's what's known as heads up digitizing. It's very similar to rotoscoping in the uh, computer graphics visual effects world. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this was because I come from the visual effects background. I was a 2D person at Digital Domain back in the day. If you can roto, you can create polygons in ArcMap. It's the same set of skills. Transferring from visual effects to working in GIS was very easy for me to do because you're dealing with the same primitives, points, lines, and polygons. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the tools, although named differently, function exactly the same way as they do in classic uh, image processing or art programs like Photoshop, Illustrator, Matador, if you've ever done any rot rotoscoping using Matador, all of those function essentially the same way. You do ha you have the ability to create 2D polygons and points and lines in uh, ArcGIS Pro that can be then, uh, you can go to like a, a layout, which in this case, I can insert a new layout. I can pick, say for instance, uh, a landscape letter layout. I can add a map frame right there. There's my map frame. And now this is a document that can be shared and printed. If I go to share, it allows me to export the layout. And the export can be done as a PDF uh, usually, or sometimes as a JPEG or a TIFF. So this is the print function of ArcGIS Pro. And that's how easy and fast it is to make a paper map from the digital information that you are creating in ArcGIS Pro. And uh, it's whether you get a GPS track from a fire guy or your heads up digitizing a polygon, or you get an, uh, a legacy aerial photograph and you wanna show what the difference is over time in terms of like structural development in an unincorporated area, whatever the requirement is. GIS, and in particular ArcGIS Pro, are very adaptable for people who have solid computer graphics skills who work in visual effects. I strongly encourage visual effects artists who are disheartened with the visual effects jobs marketplace to consider careers in GIS. But now there's also 3D components to your mapping also. I mean, you have to kind of be able to uh, see it from, you know, side view, top view or um, interactive view. Are there interactive also? Because it looks like on your 2D, uh, you start in on it and you're continuously refining it. Well, what you there are a number of functions in ArcGIS Pro that are not uh, related to drawing. Uh, we can go into view here uh, and I can um, 
let's see, where is it? Uh, I'm sorry, is it layout? Uh, I'm sorry, who? It should be, um, I thought it was view or imagery. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's analysis. Uh, you have model builders, uh, feature analysis, exploratory 3D analysis. This particular document is not set up for me to dive into yeah, a heavy but duty I'm, 3D every session. situation is different. I can imagine. You do, you do have the ability to do so. They yes. have tools. The tools are referred to as geoprocessing tools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you have a number of toolboxes that you can get into mm -hmm, and you can mm -hmm. search for. And these allow you to work with not just vector graphics, but also raster graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can uh, calculate area, you calculate volume, mm. you can cut pieces out, put pieces in, uh, you can create what's known as heat maps, continuous maps of different kinds of uh, effects that are occurring, natural phenomena. Well, the natural, this, the natural phenomena, including wind, which um, I'm assuming you don't just kind of put an arrow on the map and saying wind goes this direction because it's all different directions all around all of your mountain ranges, right? Well, we're going to go back to the internet and I'm going to go to, um, uh, I'm going to have to move this here for a moment. I'm going to go to and Francis, your tax and dollars Python. at work, <laughs> NOAA. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And you can go to their weather page and you can go to, it says here, go to National Weather Service. And so a lot of information about current weather and hazards come directly for free from the federal government on the National Weather Service. You can access active alerts. You can get forecast maps, radar. Um, the radar has an enhanced radar. And you can come in and you can turn this hazards layer off by reducing its uh, opacity. And then you come in and you can animate. And this is showing you the current radar for the United States. And as you can see, we have we just had a little bit of a small storm system move through Southern California. We can come in and zoom down on that. Uh, they do have a wind uh, page here. I don't remember where it is. No, but um, yeah, of, and I've seen your wind page too, and it's really uh, a phenomenal. A lot of information that we get when we use fire comes from uh, the National Weather Service. Now, also, I have bookmarks that I said, and there's this fire weather snooper, which is a product of the National Weather Service. And this gives us oh. um, temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and gusts uh, for Southern California. And so if like, for instance, um, if I go to uh, Los Angeles downtown, it shows me where it is, which in this case happens to be at USC. And you can come back, but you can also look at, say, for instance, um, Camarillo is located just north of Camarillo Airport, where my fire headquarters happens to be. There's a weather station there. And these are color coded. So when we have Santa Ana winds and low humidities, you get color coded here. And you'll see these, even there's some color coding here where some of the uh, more severe wind gusts are occurring. You can also sort these by columns. So right now the lowest relative humidity is listed at 17% at the El Monte station. And the El Monte station is El Monte. What was, the, what was the highest wind velocity right now? Uh, let's see. Wind. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Sorted by wind, 46 miles an hour. Santa. So there's, no, this is five. Let's go. So yeah, in Santa Barbara Island, their station is reporting 46 winds from the north northwest, Ooh. gusting to 62. Oh, 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 that part. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that would uh, also mean that you're not having a day off tomorrow. <laughs> if it's severe enough, they, they do not hesitate to call me in the middle of the night and I get out of bed and I go to work and I get in map 11 and we drive to the fire and we live out of map 11 until they release us from the fire. That, and do that, you have any need for any real time tools? Uh, well, uh, a number of the um, arc map or excuse me, arc pro uh, tools are available for um, uh, 
Like for instance, if I go back to um, the map, oops, I, did, oh, I deleted my map. Well, I'll just insert a new one. So for instance, um, when you open a map and you go to map and you add your data, okay, and I can add data. In this case, I have it on this computer. Mm -hmm. I have on this uh, desktop, my SIGGRAPH folder, and I have my field bed footprint geodatabase here. And uh, I can actually add data from that if I had any data set up for it. Right. Um, but also in a map like this, you have the ability to sign into a service. So I can actually load active weather data from a service or active fire data or other data that's available. There's another website up here. We're gonna to go to fire InsaWeb. Whoops, wrong one, InsaWeb. So this is InsaWeb, the incident website for the United States. A lot of these current fires are rather are older, but they are symbolized into active fires, uh, prescribed fires, and then bear teams, burned area emergency response. And so like, for instance, let's come down here to these two fires, there is a Radford fire. We'll go to the incident. It gives you incident overview. It gives you information about the dates, current as of Friday, October of last year, it was 100% contained. Uh, and you have a maps page on InsaWeb. And here's where you can download and view maps that are made available for the public. So you can access fire maps that are made available to the public on InsaWeb. Okay, we also, there's a wildfire intel where they have these hot lists. Ooh, an air tanker crash, that's not good. California fire and news weather. Uh, we'll come down here to six hours ago. Uh, wind has been gusting 30 to 40 miles here at Millerton Lake. I'm not sure where Millerton Lake is. Double-edged sword, badly needed rains could make more grasses. Grasses means more fire. More rain right. means more grasses, more grasses means more fire. I'm sorry to have to say that. <clears throat> uh, there are, of course, CAL FIRE. It has a lot of information. Uh, it has the fire hazard severity zones. We talked about this last week. There's two videos, and then you can access the fire hazard severity zone map. You can type in an address. Um, I'll type in, uh, well, I'm not going to type in anybody's addresses, but okay. I'm going to go uh, down. Fran, Fran can, I think, Fran, do you have the, the, whatever that one stood for? Say it again, the fire hazard. Severity <laughs> zones. Severity zone. Yes. Yes. Cal fire, fire hazard severity zones. Which, and and which was the one where you can see the last fire burnt up to the, um, or the, the current fire burnt up to the last fire and you can see it real clearly on that map. Like the, uh, the fire from 25 years ago. Uh, uh, Cal Fire has um, some fire history yeah. on their, uh, their website. I'm not, I don't remember. You showed, you showed us one during the rehearsal. Uh, I'm sorry. And again, is... you may have shown us many, many things. I'm sorry, I'm gonna search the site here for fire history. It's not letting me do it. That's okay. All right, whatever, Cal Fire, it's Cal Fire. Yeah, right um, there. The yeah, so Cal Fire has a lot of resources. Yeah. Okay, uh, and if you um, go to, uh, like for instance, just a regular Google and you can, oops, don't want that. Let's go to a fire history map. Uh, there's California wildfire histories. Let's go to images. Uh, so these are some fire history maps, California fire history with groundwater banking. There are a lot of resources online these days for uh, time enabled data basin is one website where it has California fire perimeters. So you can come in to this data basin website and you can open in map. I just don't think we all realized how much is available out there. <clears throat> There's a lot. Uh, as a person who does fire, 
I get a lot of this stuff from the publishers, but a lot of this information is made available to the public. This isn't loading, so I'm just gonna bail out of it. Um, there's also uh, in my little fire bookmarks, there's a... I mean, while he's doing this, uh, the reason why we had this meeting today of all days in the entire year is because this week, this couple weeks, is the lowest rate of a possible bad incident, you know, a fire, much like, you know, any of those things to happen. So yeah. this is the only uh, thing that Gregory could guess possibly that he might have a day off to give us this presentation. Okay, and then one last website here, Alert California, <clears throat> um, a project from UC San Diego. So these are webcams. We use webcams a lot in uh, fire mapping. So, and so do all the 911 call centers. So the information, look for instance, right here, this is uh, actually the one from my local area, which is called Rasnow Peak. So right now Rasnow Peak is showing me what's looking at the city of Thousand Oaks. And I can, you can see as I scroll through this area here, it shows you where the camera is looking and what the range of the camera is. So now and wait a minute, we're trying to figure out where all your icons are. If it looks like there's three cameras piled on one, does that mean it's an interactive camera or? There's almost usually, there's almost always two cameras at each oh, location. I see. I see. Almost But there's always. not like a couple of cameras where you can change the view, go left or right. You are not allowed any control over these cameras. The cameras yeah. are either controlled, uh, but there's like Rasno Peak 2. So that's actually looking south there. You can see that camera. And then Rasnow Peak 1, if you click on it, comes back up. But just another resource for people to uh, avail themselves. How do you know where a large wildfire is? Well, sometimes there's a web camera that shows you where it is. So there's that. This is a lot of work just trying to listen to this thing. Your well, presentation, it's, I mean. <laughs> it's a lot. There's it's like a, a lot to know. assignment. I mean, I've been uh, doing GIS since 2002, and I've been doing fire mapping since 2010, and I've been working for Ventura County Fire since 2011. And God all, of this, all of this has Ellen. changed over the last uh, five years. Wow. We've gone over this complete revolution from primarily working in paper maps Mm -hmm. So now the emphasis is on mobile applications. Right. <clears throat> and a lot of the mobile applications, the data is cloud-based. Right. So that is yet another, that's something actually I'm actively training on. And when I go back to work tomorrow, I'm going to go back into my online training right. on how to not just access right. um, fire uh, online cloud-based fire maps, but also set up my own right. uh, cloud-based map for incident well, I mean, do. when we were uh, tech rehearsing this, um, you did, and I thought it was really informative, where you were kind of showing um, uh, the area that you lived in, and I was saying I was using some of these maps to determine where I would next live or not live. Oh, well, um, that was just Google and, Maps. So I know, I... no, but but your thing was, um, I, I, I was saying, you know, Santa Ana can blow sparks really, really far. And you were saying, no, no, these things start from online too. And then you said, see this feral palm tree? So that was, I displayed that in Google Maps. So Google Maps has this uh, 3D function now, which mm -hmm. you can do a globe view. And in this particular case. Wait, okay. where's globe view? Do that again. Uh, you go to Google oh, Maps. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, down in the lower left, there's Hello. a more. Oh, more. You go to satellite, and there's Globe View. Oh, Globe View. And Globe View is the 3D port of Google Maps. Huh. And you can hold down Shift. That's and hold the down one your left thing I was key. missing. Ah. Yes. And so I live in this neighborhood, and adjacent to my neighborhood is a grove of feral palm trees, palm trees that are not maintained. And when I create my wildland fuels map, this is some of the information that I use to verify the, whether the mm -hmm. polygon needs to be trimmed or not. And in this case, you can go down to Google Street View and you can very clearly see that there's some very hairy palm trees 
in this area and that um, I might have to uh, worry about them at some point in the future. Um, while you're doing that, uh, Gregory okay. Panos is asking a, a question about, do you utilize photogrammetry or 3D terrain or drone spatial mapping and or VR AR tools at all? Yes, we do. So in ArcGIS Pro, here it is, here's convert. So I'm now gonna convert the 2D map to a, I can do a global scene, which is ESRI's version of Google Earth, or I can do a local scene. So I'm gonna to convert to a local scene. The base map then defaults to a cloud-based elevation layer, which is world elevation 3D terrain 3D. And I can come down say for instance, into my area, that area I was just looking at in Thousand Oaks. In Segura, we were west of the 23, right there. And then you have the ability to have a 3D map. And you can apply 3D data, you can apply 2D data, drape it over the terrain that um, ESRI provides to you. You can enter your own terrain, either through contours, what's known as DEM, digital elevation models, or from uh, like the uh, you know, uh, terrain you custom make. There are construction companies that use GIS software to come in and cut out house pads that aren't built yet to determine how much volume of dirt they're gonna get and whether or not they have enough dirt to fill in the valleys to determine uh, if, they're, uh, if they have to buy dirt in order to make enough house pads to do a residential development. Oh, that makes sense. That's a real well, job. And That's also a 3D the, GIS um, job. I can imagine that from any particular view, there will be some, some item that's occluded by a, an edge of a cliff or you know, like your helicopter had to go down into a train. So you're constantly looking at something from a different angle and making uh, maps for whoever needs whatever information. Well, I don't have it loaded. <clears throat> but that herbs fire was, there's, um, let's see, where's herbs? There's North Moore Park. Uh, I think that's herbs, there's herbs. So this is where that herbs fire was. And this is now being displayed in um, 3D in ArcGIS Pro. And you can see if I had those two polygons, you could see I was parked here. The helicopter went down here. The dozer was over here. Uh, and um, the uh, perimeters were here and here. I can change the base map to imagery and it'll drape the photo layer over the 3D. So you have the ability to come down and drill down in there and visualize uh, an aerial photography draped Very over 3D helpful. terrain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now this terrain is not the most uh, highest resolution terrain data. It's, which a, is why it's, it's a lot better of, than we had, right? Well, it's, 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 it is a layer that is in the ARC Pro software that is provided to you by ESRI. So you can use their analysis tools for like feature analysis, 3D analysis, geostatistical wizard, whatever. So you can... Uh, use these tools to uh, analyze and determine values for things like slope and aspect and elevation. And all of those actually end up being important to wildland fuels because slope and aspect and elevation determine how much sunlight the hillside is going to get. And if you've got a lot of sunlight on your hillside, your fuels are going to dry out earlier in the year rather than later. So for instance, if we kind of flatten this go and look at north, we can see, um, for instance, these hills down here. And by the way, that uh, webcam I was looking at is down here. It'll. Uh, where is it'll, down here, Greg? Down here, there's there. I, it I is. Know, that's Rasno Peak. So what, that's where what, that webcam what is. What part of the world, right there? Are we? This is Ventura of? County. Oh, I see. Here's uh, here's Santa Monica. There's Marina mm -hmm. Del Rey. Mm -hmm. There's um. Point Doom, uh, there's Point Magoo. Here's Ventura City, the Ventura River. This is the Santa Clara River. Uh, Simi Valley is here. 
Oh, this I is see. San Fernando Valley. Uh, Santa Clarita is up here. So all of this comes in as it's not just a viewer like Google Maps and Google Earth are. We you look have pretty the ability dried to out by this map. and do um, geostatistical analysis on map data in the ArcGIS Pro software. Yeah. So yes, mm -hmm. the answer to the question is yes, we do use all different kinds of map data, photo, photogram photogrammetry, elevation data, 2D data that's either scanned from maps uh, or uh, legacy photographs. And then there's a lot of data that we create. So do you have to ever feed um, any of this data into a VR application? Do you ever see that happening? Uh, Maybe, I haven't if not seen now, VR you... yet. <clears throat> I do know that if you go to... Well, I mean, like, it, it, let's just say there's so much smoke in front of you, so much smoke that you don't even know where the cliff is. But... Uh... Uh, they, they don't have sort of like data that does that. So this right. is ESRI's website, and a lot of information about higher end functions like that are available uh, on the ESRI website. Uh, ESRI has a, um, they have events that you can attend, uh, like SIGGRAPH. They have an event um, this uh, July in San Diego. Uh, it's a professional conference. It's the 2023 ESRI user conference. Um, I get to go for free because my unit has a site license. We have like 15 licenses, so I get a pass to go. Um, they do want you to pay if you're not an existing ESRI software subscriber. <clears throat> you can get a student pass. You have to contact ESRI and apply for it. They also have student volunteers. So you can go and actually work at the ESRI user conference if you're a student and you uh, don't, you won't get paid, but you'll get to be at the conference and you can get to go to conference functions. So ESRI uh, is a pretty um, comprehensive company in terms of uh, what their products are. They have uh, mapping, spatial analysis and data science, imagery and remote sensing. They recently developed a series, a suite of applications that allow you to map floors inside a building. I'm not kidding. Uh, 3D visualization and analytics, data management. You can become a developer for them. Uh, they also have um, uh, you know, they also have uh, careers. So for instance, you can come in and you know, if you have uh, been working in um, certain kinds of uh, engineering and design, you've got 2D, 3D software developers. Again, a lot of skills that are in current use in visual effects are directly applicable to GIS. You can leverage career development through companies like ESRI and make the change from, say, for instance, writing shading software, uh, you know, for a renderer at a, at a 3D house somewhere to doing 2D and 3D software development at ESRI. And ESRI is a global company. They own, they're not only in Redlands in California. They have offices and development sites uh, in different places. They have remote, multiple locations. They have places in Ottawa, here we go, a cloud product engineer in New Delhi, India. Um, it's a huge company. You never really hear about them, but in many ways, they're just as big as Microsoft. So again, you know, my sales pitch, my reason for giving this presentation is to encourage people who currently work in visual effects to expand their horizons and consider GIS as a career. Not, you know, not just as a side career to working in um, visual effects, but as an alternate career. You can work in GIS, find a corporate or government job, and not get laid off every three months. That's a reality. And for a lot of people who are in their 20s, VI, visual effects is fun. But you get into your 30s, you buy a house, you're married, you have a kid. It's not so fun anymore having to look for work every six months. GIS gives you the opportunity to leverage your existing computer graphics skills into an alternate career that can be lucrative and rewarding. Silence, dead silence in the room. Did I lose everybody? Can't hear anyone. Joan, you're muted. Sounds like fun. Okay, there you go. 
<laughs> well, it's I a real, you know, it's a real thing. I mean, it, it's a, it, you know, and it worked for me. I, well, I, I the mean, last time I worked on visual effects was in 2002. No, yeah. it, but uh, besides the fact that it is a real deal for getting laid off and uh, then not getting laid off. I mean, this has been going on as long as I have been in the industry, uh, you know, they bring everybody on and then at the end of a project, poof, everybody's gone. If you're project oriented, um, very few had um, jobs that went past projects or unless you were on four projects in a row. Um, so it is a really big deal. As a mother, however, I don't see, um, you know, me encouraging a child to take, you know, some vehicle up into some raging wildfire. Well, it, there's a there's a lot of GIS that has nothing to do with public safety. Well, you know, there's a lot of GIS that is conducted for research uh, at academic institutions. There are a lot of uh, corporations that provide. GIS products, like all of the different uh, satellite imagery companies. Um, you know, Google itself, Google Maps have, needs all kinds of developers. They do, to, for sure. They do. So you don't have to drive a mapping van through a fire to work in GIS. That's just a tiny, small uh, part of what GIS and nor, is. And nor do you have to drive a bulldozer into a fire. Well, no, you don't have to be a dozer operator either for fire. Um, but, you know, like the, the guy that um, had the intern position at the city of Culver City before I got there, he left Culver City and he took a job with a developer, a construction company in Orange County, and he ended up driving a little four by four, you know, one of those little uh, um, like a Polaris or something that had a GPS receiver attached to it. And he was measuring polygons in a construction site so they could come in and determine how much soil would be needed to remove to flatten house pads. So, I mean, literally you're being paid to drive an ATV with a GPS unit on it. That's your job. And then you take the GPS track from that uh, GPS unit, you take it back, you use ESRI software and you prepare maps for the developer so they can make decisions about where they're gonna have to remove and where they're gonna have to add soil in order to make the house pads for a residential development. That's real. That's a real job. Yeah. I mean, okay. and, and, but there's not really out of everything that you showed us tonight, there isn't really a, a something that sits on the web sites anywhere that I've seen that says, these are jobs you can have. And yes, there like are. Yes, there is, Joan. Oh, there's, the GIS and there's a website for that too. Jobs Clearinghouse. Well, who knew? Okay. GIS Jobs Clearinghouse. And you can view the all jobs posting and it tells you who's hiring and where. Well, see, and you had to ask. Geospatial technician in Las Vegas Valley for the uh, Las Vegas Water District. I don't know if you paid attention to the news lately, Joan, but water's kind of an issue in Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, it tells you what the salary range is, what the hours of work are, what the requirements and what the um, uh, uh, job duties are going to be. And well, they want you to is. know GIS and AutoCAD for this one. So you don't and even AutoCAD. have to know. Yeah, AutoCAD's still a big player in uh, spatial, spatial news. You know, uh, some of these are um, uh, Kingston, New York, GIS section chief. What's that? Mm -hmm. uh, New York Department of Environmental Projection, Protection. So there are a lot of jobs that are uh, government, academia, and corporate jobs that um, you can use GIS skills in very lucratively and they don't have anything to do with putting out fires. So yes, there is a, there is a GIS jobs market. It's just been a plethora of information tonight. I, I just really applaud you, Gregory, for doing this all for us. It seems like you almost have spent the last 10 years just figuring out where you can get all this information from. Well, you try and learn. So, um, as some of you may uh, have gathered, I'm not exactly a 20 year old anymore. I'm actually coming up on retirement next year. So there's gonna be job openings. Uh, it's unlikely within a year you could get all the qualifications to work at Ventura County Fire, but the GIS job market is developing. ESRI right. every year develops new software, uh, new algorithms, mm. there's always need for people like me that um, mm -hmm. came from 2D, I was a pixel pusher, a digital domain. 
Right. And now I'm a mapping specialist at a large Southern California County Fire Department. Right. But there's a lot of GIS where if you were doing, if you were writing shaders, you can write um, possibly some kind of 3D uh, application for uh, an aerial imagery company. And if you were doing modeling for 3D or animation, it's potentially right. uh, available to you to do uh, work in like, for instance, that software. If you're they, ready uh, to quit screen sharing, I'm sure we'd love to see your face again, unless you're, there's one more thing you needed to show. No, that's pretty much it. I will stop screen no, sharing. No, you, uh, yeah, because you and I uh, can uh, just uh, say hey to each other. No one's seen our faces essentially this whole evening. Not that okay, well, you've seen my me. face. Uh, I know so, that's you. So um, I, I hope uh, I hope people. Oh, here's some Q and A. I didn't get to see Q and A. Wow, Q and A. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, might it be possible to share these slides? Uh, yeah, you guys can have the slides. Um, how is Gregor coordinating wildland fuel management with our state and federal biodiversity conservation planning? Uh, we have a job position at Ventura County Wildland called the uh, pre-fire engineer. Uh, she coordinates grant funding with CAL FIRE primarily, uh, and she works a lot with fire safe councils in Southern California. And so some of the information about wildland fuel management is conducted through our wildland office uh, through our pre-fire engineer. Um, another example, nature-based approaches to management of wildland. I, you know, CAL FIRE and the Forest Service, they go back and forth on what their techniques and protocols are. Uh, if you really want to know about um, alternative approaches to wildland management and uh, things like uh, approaches to wildland urban interface. Mm -hmm. There are a number of academic resources. There are also resources online like the Great Basin Institute, mm -hmm. uh, the Sierra Club, and um, Center for Biological Diversity. You can get some information that relates to these questions there. The uh, photogrammetry, Club. I uh -huh. touched that, ESRI. You don't, you don't have to go quite so fast and yeah. just let everybody hear your answers because you're zooming through this and we're trying to keep up with you. <clears throat> okay, so yes, their developer conference in Palm Springs. I'm not Wait, a developer. Wait, say the question again. The ESRI, it's a comment. ESRI developer conference is in March in Palm Springs. Uh, so the ESRI website has information about that. Uh, DevSum, ESRI DevSum. Yes, sir, Arc Pro will plug in with Unreal Engine. Is that a question? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. You'd have to contact ESRI directly <clears throat> to find out if you could be one of their developers and develop an interface between their software and Unreal Engine. And uh, I'm saying, you know, we haven't all come up with all the, you know, it, it, uh, as I have watched computer graphics evolve, the second someone comes up with, hey, can anyone use this? Boom, we take it and we've uh, already brought it to its knees. So you come up with something like um, shove this into the Unreal Engine and it will get used. They just haven't, you know, they don't know it exists, a lot of them. Um, ESRI has a product, which is actually a company they bought outright that was originally from Australia. It was called uh, CityWorks. And CityWorks has been used in some feature films to create uh, cities that don't exist in real life. Uh, I don't remember if it was one of the Batman ones, but I, I know I did talk to some people at one of the user conferences that worked with CityWorks that created uh, an urban landscape for a feature film. And uh, they basically did it with some pieces of some building modeling that existed, but they also created a lot of uh, uh, a proprietary modeling for that particular project. So there's, so there's that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you don't really hear about ESRI a lot, but they're, they're there. And then there's a, there we go, anonymouscityworks.com. Thank you, whoever the anonymous attendee is. Uh, anonymous attendee is really helping me out here. Thank you. We will keep him anonymous. Okay. So, you know, I've given you a number of resources. National Wildfire Coordinating think? Group, ESRI, NOAA, um, National uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, do a lot of searching. Type GIS, type GIS for 3D, type GIS for 3D jobs, go for it. Just like you look for work when trying to find movies, you got to put the, uh, the time in 
and kind of hit the digital pavement and search around, you'll get a lot of information. It'll whet your appetite. I mean, I get into some of this stuff. I learn stuff all the time that's applicable in my work. Uh, there's some uh, academic seminars. There's a uh, Southern California uh, Wildland Consortium that uh, has seminars. Um, I can't remember the, uh, um, the exact name of those groups, but uh, if you do internet searches for say, for instance, nature-based approaches to wildland urban interface, just type in that in a search engine and it'll take you to some of these organizations. And some of those organizations are hiring. Great Basin Institute has jobs. Um, I think uh, Grand Canyon Institute, some of the wilderness societies, you know, some of the fire safe councils even hire consultants. So it's all based on basically geography. Having uh, a bachelor's degree in geography is an excellent ticket into this universe. Mm. And then the more GSR, ESRI software you learn, kind of the more it pulls you in. It's not a perfect world. You know, you're still going to have problems with jobs and projects that go south and employers that are too far from right. you and pay that's not really meeting your needs. But I know for myself, you know, I worked in the entertainment industry for 20 years. I worked in film and television. Uh, I worked on, I ended up working in visual effects and, you know, getting laid off two or three times a year just doesn't cut it. So you can find a steady job in GIS. You just you have, have to like, been steady prepare yourself. Since, since you have jumped to this whole thing that we, you call your life, um, it, <laughs> you have, it's been straight through. You've never had another layoff. Right? Uh, not not working for the fire department, you know. There it is. Okay. So, so yeah. We've answered the questions. Is there any uh, last thought that you... Um, you know, as an aside, uh, did not cover that, you know, you wanted to also get out there? Well, not really, except that um, <laughs> GIS been very, very good to me. Uh, I strongly encourage um, uh, current visual effects artists to consider uh, retooling themselves for a second career. It's uh, certainly an excellent second career for via, via visual effects artists who, uh, and they find themselves in their 30s and 40s. You know, if you have the resources to be able to go back to school and get a bachelor's in geography uh, right. and learn the GIS software, you can find work. Spoken like a true father. I, I encourage people to think outside the visual effects box. Amen for that. Well, thank you. And thank you for, uh, uh, for all attending Computer Graphics for Wildfire Mapping. Um, this is the Los Angeles ACM SIGGRAPH chapter, and it's run by volunteers and members and the computer graphics community. Consider joining us or consider donating to us or consider you know, helping out as a volunteer. Um, we operate entirely on contributions from members. So you know, consider helping out here. We are Los Angeles ACM SIGGRAPH. Um, you can join our chapter um, just going to our website. Uh, we are just real easy to remember, la-sigraph.org, https, la-sigraph.org. Um, so, you know, become a member today. Essentially, I think our meeting has ended, and I would say adieu to you and you. Uh, if anyone else has a quick question, otherwise join us next time. You saw the whole list of um, upcoming events that we've got going on, which, uh, you know, we've got the future of AI uh, in arts and entertainment coming up in April. We are out at JPL in May. We have the state of the metaverse with Larry Rosenthal uh, in June and uh, the Madison Square Garden Sphere Studio Tour. Uh, in uh, uh, Burbank in June also. Uh, if that doesn't keep you guys out of trouble, I don't know what. And if you want to uh, suggest a, a meeting that you would like to hear, <laughs> James Tucker wishes to speak. Um, I don't know if we can highlight uh, uh, Jim Tucker. Um, I, I, look at that. Jim Tucker, you're on, my friend. Uh, can, I don't know. Can you hear me? 
can I can hear, hear you, which means the whole world can hear you too. Oh, Go ahead and oh ask your God. question, Jim. Well, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to copy paste some of these links in the chat, and somehow well, um, my no, uh, paste won't work. Copy paste won't work. Uh, well, uh, mm, how well, can I get these later? Can I get these later? Oh, oh, somehow? oh because it's a webinar. Uh, um, it, it when it's a Zoom, uh, straight ahead of Zoom, but you're into a webinar. So um, we will have to get you anything that you're asking for. You can uh, hit me afterwards, uh, Jim, and I will try to get you this information. But yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, Jim, I'll we'll, we, more, we're more keeping track of, of all of these links and even the ones that yes. people are suggesting. Yes, yes, yes. And, and but we will I, go ahead, Fran. I was I, just going to say that we we're we're going to make a copy of them and they will be made available. Yes, what I didn't get uh, to say is that. For whatever reason, it's a new Zoom thing which comes up every single month we do something. Uh, Zoom is not letting us allow the um, participants, the attendees, excuse me, uh, to copy um, the chats anymore. That's a whole new thing. Um, but hmm. as, as a panelist, uh, we can copy chats. So we are documenting this. So if you have any questions specifically, uh, you can get it from us. We also are recording this whole information. So you can go back uh, and look at this again on our um, chapter YouTube account. We let you, we will update you as, as soon as we get it uh, posted up there. So those are our solutions. Um, we're here to help you though, but uh, um, thank you for um, chiming up. That is a fair question. It comes up a lot. That's all I know, people. Uh, Okie doke, thank you. <laughs> you bet, James. Um, have a good day. And have a great evening, everybody. Gregory, our hats off to you for your whole career, your service to uh, our community here in Los Angeles. And we are out of here, my friends.